morning. It's nice to, oh boy, see if I can get a little, I have an oddly shaped head. It's one of the challenges. It's really good to see you all. It's good to be here. It's, it's good to see your, your eyes anyway, if not your faces. There's some really fancy masks going on out there. I appreciate it. Some, um, and for everybody who's online with us today, thank you for thank you for joining us. Um, I'm 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 grateful to have a chance to to share with you this morning and to um, to bring you a message that I I hope uh, encourages all of us um, and builds us up and uh, prepares us for the work that Christ has for us. And I want to tell you I want to start uh, just by telling you. We had a strange week in the Sobis household this past week. It was the, um, as, as, mo- as many of you know, I think, uh, Courtney and I and, and Jonah and Eli um, started down this path towards, towards doing foster care um, <clears throat> about two years ago now. And so for the last year and a half or so, uh, we've had <laughs> these two beautiful, like, bonus children in our home uh, and in our family. Uh, Chloe and Caden, who most of you know, and it it's just been it's been a roller coaster. Um, all of the all of the highs and all of the lows, and all at once with two kids at the same time. Um, but we've gotten to see them grow into these like incredible little people. You know, Caden uh, was uh, he was about two months old when he first came to us, and now he's this eighteen month old. Well, he's older than that. He's a little older than that. Uh, but just, you know, just like flying through the house, up and down the stairs, flipping over the sofas, like <laughs> thinks that he could just conquer the world, toddler. And, and, and Chloe is just this beautiful and stubborn and <laughs> uh, three-year-old. And it's just, you know, I, I, it just amazes me to see how, how these things have, have changed and progressed. And so during this time, um, this, this past week was actually the first, uh, the first week that they had an overnight visit with their, with their biological mom. Um, and so Thursday was like the quietest day at our house in, we don't remember. Well, I mean, we, we just moved into this house. So this is, it was the quietest day at our house. Um, but we miss them so much, you know? Uh, and so they, they come back on Friday and we're all like really excited that they're back. Everything's, everything's great um, until bedtime. <laughs> and at, at bedtime, Chloe threw her like just the biggest temper tantrum that the Sobis household has had to deal with um, in, our, in our existence. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was hard for us, but it was obviously a lot harder for her. Um, and you know, I think what was happening was that for the first time in a long time, she was dealing with a uh, she was dealing with two different realities, right? Like two different sets of norms, two different sets of rules, two different households, two different families, um, and that 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 that's that's hard for anybody, right? But I, I imagine it's I imagine it's harder for a three-year-old than it is for uh, for an adult, even though we can imagine as adults that that's, that's hard for us when we encounter it. Um, and so I, I want to I say real quick, just like, please don't, please don't take this the wrong way. This is not a uh, judgment on anybody. This is not a, like, the Sobis way is the best way. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's just different by, by virtue of being two different families. Um, and so that is actually what I hope uh, we can sort of wrestle with today. Um, I want to I want to pose to you that that Jesus, um, in in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to study today, uh, poses to us a new reality, a second reality that we all have to we all have to deal with one way or another, um, and he just. He does it through these blessings. These, he just gives these blessings over all of these different groups of people. 
uh, or types of people or characteristics of, of, of people. Um, and they are, they are set against the, the blessings that the world offers. And it's very clear. He doesn't even have to say it. Um, but we'll, and we'll see that when we get into it. And it's, it's fascinating. The, uh, the blessings, they're not commandments. They're not him telling us what we have to do. It's just an announcement. It's just like, this is, here you go. This is what it, this is what it is. This is what reality actually is. Um, and, and just kind of leaves it hanging out there for us to decide, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to, how are we going to respond? And we basically have, we have two options, right? We can, we can seek the blessings that the world offers, which, though conflicting and, and, and weak, uh, are at least familiar to us. You know, like, we all know how the world works and how to get the world's blessing. And on the other hand, we can, we can seek the blessings that, that Jesus offers, that are strange and unintuitive, but, but just maybe more real and, and more vivid than what the world offers. And so maybe as we go through this, um, maybe we'll find like, like poor Chloe that we're like kicking and screaming and fighting against these like internal realities, right? Like, we have the one that we experience on the day-to-day that tells us that strong is the way that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be right. We've got to like win our arguments, you know? We've got to, we've got to make sure that people, people know that we're right. We've got, uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we, the world values power. The world values the exercise of power. Um, and Jesus seems to have a very different sense of, of what that means and of what, what good is and what blessing is. Um, and so I want to I wanna talk about that today. So let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Because we're going to be talking about the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, what has come to be known as the Beatitudes, um, the blessings of Jesus. Uh, So let's pray, and then we're going to pick up our our text in verse 1. Father in heaven, we are just so grateful um, for your word. Your word is is incredible. Um, It's incredible to us, and it is a a light to us, um, and it exposes all kinds of things within us. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, it brings us to your son. Um, and that's, that's what I, I pray for this morning, Lord, that, uh, that through, uh, through these words, your, your son would be made known. Um, and that the, the life that's in him and offered by him would be uh, would be communicated well and would, uh, would mold and shape our hearts and our lives um, as only he can. We love you. We pray these things in his name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you probably know that there's another blessed, but we're going to save that one for later. So hold off. Um, I want to dig into what we've got here first. So, stump speeches. So the, f- the first thing that I want to talk about, in, in verse 2 of my translation, it says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And so I think there's something interesting here that's not, that's not really readily apparent on the surface. Um, see, we call this the Sermon on the Mount, and rightly so, because that's what it is. But I think it gives the feeling that this is a one-off teaching of Jesus, that he, that he did this one time, you know, because um, we only have the one recorded in, in Matthew. But I think that this is more of Jesus' go-to message as he's traveling around the countryside of, of Galilee and healing people and uh, announcing the kingdom and drawing people to him. This is, this is, his, this is his sort of well-crafted, well-worn announcement. It's his stump speech. Um, and I think this for a couple of reasons. One is we do have a similar speech recorded in Luke chapter 6 uh, that opens in the same way, contains a lot of the same elements, um, but it's, it's all tweaked a little bit for a slightly different audience and a slightly different time. And two, there's a uh, Greek verb tense going on here. So I, I've probably lost, like, are there any grammar fans in the room? See, I got one hand, and I think it was lying. Oh, I think, okay, I got a couple over here. That's good. Um, so I'll try to be brief about this, but I think it's helpful because there's, I think there's something that might get lost in, in this word just being used uh, in the past tense that, uh, that he taught them. Um, because in the imperfect tense in the, in, in the Greek, it gives the sense of something that somebody was in the regular habit of doing. And so we, we kind of lose that in the translation, though, right? But I think we could read it as something like, and he opened his mouth, and as was his habit, taught them, saying, and then goes on with the Sermon on the Mount. And so to me, this changes things a little bit, uh, because this isn't just an announcement or a message that Jesus delivers once, uh, the way that we read it, we only have to read it once, um, or it only has to be recorded in writing once. But this, he was traveling around preaching, right? This is his, this is his jam. <laughs> and, I, and I think if it's his, if it's that important to him, then I, I think it's, it should be that important to us too. And so he opens his mouth, and as was his habit, taught them saying that, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I, I wonder, like, does that just come across as, like, kind of a nice sentiment to us today? If we really dig into this and, and think about what we're reading, uh, do, we, do we find something more than a, a really familiar, nice passage, nice way of opening what does become a, quickly a very challenging message from Jesus? Um, but I think it's one of those t- one of those times where we we read the word blessing and we use it in like church and and you know religious sort of settings a lot. Like uh, we we talk about being blessed. I, t- I talk about being being blessed. I have been richly blessed, but I wonder sometimes if that has lost some of the original meaning. You know, and I think we need to kind of fight for it a little bit. And there's actually a term for what happens when you read a word or say a word over and over again uh, until it like, have you ever had this experience? Have you ever looked at a word and you've said it in your head a couple of times and all of a sudden it just feels strange? Like it's not quite the word that you thought it was, or, but it is, you know what I'm saying? Um, that's actually, it's, it's, it's actually a term for that called semantic satiation. Yeah. That's fun. Somebody got to make that up. Um, <laughs> it's like psychology papers written about it. Um, but anyway, that's what I think that's what happens here, right? Like we read the word blessed 
uh, so many times, and we use it in our language so many times that it's like, it's like good, right? Like, what is good? Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so I, wanna, I want us to stop and think about some of the terms that we're seeing. What, what does blessed mean? Who are the poor in spirit? Why is theirs the kingdom of heaven? What, is, what does this mean? Why, why is it theirs and not somebody else's? Um, the terms pure in heart and peacemakers, they actually only appear here in like all of the New Testament. It's, so it's hard to like map these terms, and it's, but it's important because, because Jesus is, is, this is how he's opening like his, his message uh, that he's giving. So I want to start with blessed because it is, it is the most important word in this passage probably. It's the one that kind of holds this whole thing together. Uh, and I think if we, get, if we get it, all the other parts will sort of fall into place. So does anybody else's Bible use a different word instead of blessed? Does anybody have a different translation? Sometimes you'll see, sometimes it'll be translated as happy. Um, if nobody sees that, that's great. I was going to tell you to cross it out, and I, I felt bad about saying that. So, because um, I think in like the, the Venn diagram of blessed and happy, there's like a little, happy's like this, and blessed is like this, you know? And they kind of overlap a little bit down here. Um, but, I think, but I think blessed is not that helpful either, because it doesn't have a very clear meaning to all of us all the time. Uh, and so I want to suggest that I think uh, that, the, that the term approved by God um, is, is maybe a slightly better term, um, at least. It's it's certainly much wider and deeper than just happiness. Um, and looking at our passage, I want to talk about how blessed is used in this context. So it's almost always that the blessing is present and the reward is future. Almost always. There's a couple of exceptions, and we can, we'll talk about that later. But it's always blessed are with for they shall. Um, and the blessings are conditional. Um, I think that's kind of an uncomfortable word, but the blessings are conditional. They're given to particular people groups, right? The poor in spirit, uh, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Those are the conditions of the blessing. Um, and note, note that there's an orientation to, to those, too, that there's that some of these are sort of inward facing towards yourself, like the poor in spirit. Um, some of them are outward facing into the community, like the, the peacemakers. And some of them are upward facing toward, toward the Lord, persecuted for righteousness' sake. Three, the blessings are purposefully organized. Um, they have a particular shape to them. Uh, there is an order at play here. Um, you'll notice that the first and the last proper blessings offer the same reward for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and that's a, that's not a mistake. He didn't like accidentally repeat something. It's, it's a literary device for, for, you know, ancient speakers so that they could, sh so they could show you like this, this block of ideas is all really interrelated. It's all one, it's all one concept. Um, and I think in between those for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's just this really, at least to me, a, a really beautiful progression of, um, of character to reward to character to reward that goes throughout uh, the blessings. Um, they seem to escalate, right? Like the mourning are comforted um, and all the way up to uh, the peacemaker is the, is the child of God, the son of God. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the only way to understand these uh, or to group the blessings together, but I think it's been, it's been helpful to me anyway, so I wanted to point that out. And, and I, and I want to mention that um, the blessings, I know I said this before, but number four, the blessings are pronouncements. They're not commands. Um, this is important, I think, because I think we have a tendency to read them and immediately want to know, like, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do to get these? Uh, but these are, these are not commands. This is news. 
Jesus is delivering news and announcements about the kingdom of heaven, about God's kingdom, um, and what reality is in that kingdom. And five, and this is probably pretty obvious to us, but the news of the blessings is being delivered by Jesus, uh, and nobody else could, could bring it. Um, but it's, it's also interesting because uh, in, in all of the verses and in every translation that I've ever seen, it always says, blessed are. Blessed are the blah, blah, blah. Um, but the R isn't actually there. It's, it's sort of implied, but it's really just, it's as if there were, as if it said blessed, and then there was a colon, and then the rest of the phrase. It's like, blessed, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's a little awkward, but I think the idea is that the blessing is God the Father's, and Jesus is delivering this news and he's just explaining that this is, this is so. This is the case. Um, and and the, the implied question is, do we trust that he's telling us the truth? Uh, and I think that's an easier question for some of us today, uh, knowing the full story and, uh, and being you know, followers of, of Jesus Christ. But for the people who were hearing this for the first time, while Jesus was walking the earth as a man, uh, that was not a that was not a foregone conclusion, right? Because you could look around, you could think about who he's talking to. Um, towards the end of Matthew chapter four, he is talking. Uh, he's 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 going around to all the towns. He's preaching about the kingdom of God. He is healing people. Um, he he is attracting crowds of people. These are like the so these are the rejected, these are the outcasts of society that, that are just coming around Jesus and wanting to hear his message and feeling like they have hope for the first time. Um, but it's not a foregone conclusion who, who he is to them in their, in their understanding. Um, so I, th- I think that perspective is, is helpful sometimes. And, and I want to ask you for a little bit more uh, leeway because there's there's a, there's a little something going on with the word blessed that I can't really prove in the text, and I just want to let I just want to share this with you because I just think it's a really beautiful image. Um, so, one one thing about the Sermon on the Mount is that we are reading the English translation of a Greek translation of what was probably first recorded in Hebrew of what Jesus spoke in either Hebrew or Aramaic, likely, right? And so the exact words that were picked. Uh, there, we, can, we can talk about that. But there's a Hebrew word uh, for blessed, baruch, uh, which I'm probably butchering just in my pronunciation of it. But the word baruch uh, is a very common word for blessed in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures, and is often used um, when God is the one doing the blessing. Uh, there's an ant on the podium. That's random. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so but this word Baruch has as as its sort of root image, uh, the picture behind it is of one who is kneeling, kneeling. Do y'all do y'all feel that like? I, for so here we have here we have Jesus, the the King, right? Who is coming into the world to pronounce that the kingdom of heaven is here. He's pronouncing blessing. And and the traditional word that would have been used has the image of the one who's doing the blessing is kneeling. Um, Which is just, like, what kind of king is this? You know? What kind of king comes conquering into the world and, and, and kneels. We kneel. <laughs> that's, that's for us to do. But it's, it's, almost, it's almost fitting anyway, right? Because Jesus will later wash his disciples' feet, almost, almost surely kneeling as he did so. And Jesus 
would say that he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he gives up everything, worlds and life beyond imagining, to come down here, which for him was much, already much lower than kneeling, to save us. So I, I know we spent a lot of time on this, but I hope this helps like, give us a, a slightly different, richer picture of what blessed, what blessed is. It's, it's, a lot more than, it's a lot more than happy. And so I want to get a hold of what's actually being said in, in these blessings now. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I want to tell you that the college and career group has been working through the Sermon on the Mount the last few weeks also, um, and we started with this passage as well um, and spent a week talking about uh, the, the blessings of Jesus. And, and so, you know, I told them that I'm just, I've just crowdsourced this message from everything that they told me uh, while we were studying it together. Um, but I, and I specifically remember working through uh, this blessing and feeling this just, this joy of, of wrestling in the scriptures with a group of, of other like-minded believers who, who care deeply about Jesus and care deeply about uh, the world that we're in and, and, and care deeply about each other. And so, so you know, two, two quick things. If, if you're here today and you have recently graduated high school or you're not really Maybe you haven't just recently graduated high school, but you're, you're not really ready to call yourself an adult. Um, then please come out and, and join, uh, join in, in, in with our group. We would love, we would love to have you. Um, so come talk to me or come talk to, to Courtney or come talk to uh, any one of us about it. And two, if you don't fit into those categories, you're like, you're adulting okay, you know, you can, um, or you otherwise don't have a group of people to wrestle through scripture with, then I, it's my prayer that you would get plugged into one because it, it's just, it's a weekly highlight. Um, <laughs> it is a blessing uh, to, to do this, to do this with others. And I, I hope each of us would, would have a group of people that we can do that with. Uh, I think it's really important. And so, so what the group essentially came up with in studying this is that the poor in spirit are really those who realize and confess that they're the poor in spirit. Because in reality, without Jesus, every one of us is poor. We are spiritually destitute. We are we're bankrupt, right? We have nothing to offer. And so it's that recognition that under your own power, you're not worthy. You're not fit to be in the presence of God. It's like Isaiah when he found himself in the, in the throne room and he just wept because he was sure that he was just going to blink out of existence, you know? Um, and so to be poor in spirit is to have this like conscious, repentant confession of your unworthiness and your need of God, uh, your need for God. And so why is the kingdom of heaven theirs? Um, and I'm just going to read this quote from D.A. Carson, because I think he, he does a really good job with this. He writes, It's not surprising, then, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit. At the very outset of the Sermon on the Mount, we learn that we don't have the spiritual resources to put any of the sermon's precepts into practice. We can't fulfill God's standards ourselves. We must come to him and acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy, emptying ourselves of our own self-righteousness, our own moral self-esteem, and our personal vainglory. Emptied of these things, we are ready for him to fill us. Much of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is designed to remove these self-delusions from us and foster within us a genuine spirit of poverty. The genuineness and depth of this repentance is a prime requirement for entering into life. I'm going to read that again. It says, the genuineness and depth of the repentance of the poverty of spirit is a prime requirement for entering into life. And so I think from there that some of these things kind of follow um, more, more intuitively. So we have next, blessed are the, those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I mentioned earlier the, 
we're, we're faced with this choice of the blessings of the world versus the blessings that Jesus offers, um, the blessings that are of his kingdom. And I, I want to suggest this is one of those places where this is, frankly, is uh, pretty, pretty obvious. Like, the world does not care for mourning people, right? We, we don't, there's no value in, uh, in crying or mourning or being upset all the time from the world's perspective, um, and it's hard even for us, I think. Like, we don't want to be those, like, long-faced Christians who are, like, upset all the time and grumpy about things. But that's not what this is about. This is, this is a recognition. Uh, once, once we have recognized our own poverty of spirit and the poverty of spirit in all the world, that's what, that's what we're mourning. We mourn our own sin we mourn the state of the world. We mourn what should have been or what could have been and what isn't, right? We, we know that there are all these people that are just rushing towards eternity. And, and we, we mourn because we, we, know, we, know that we know the fate. We can see the degradation of, of the physical world around us and we mourn that. And Christian or not, like, I think we can all see that things aren't, things aren't great in the world. Things aren't, they're not all put right. This is not in our hearts the way that things should operate. And so we mourn. But if we accept Jesus' version of, of reality, then we take comfort in even knowing that we will be comforted. And I think some of the challenging questions here are, are you one who mourns, at least from time to time? Do you, do you see these troubles in the world and, and the, the poverty of spirit in the world and mourn for the way that things should be and aren't right now? Or do we hide? Do we turn away from sort of the troubles of the world and just, you know, hide in, in superficial pleasures so that we can sort of numb ourselves to what we don't want to see? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Who says meek anymore? <laughs> help, help with this one. Uh, I, Psalm 37, verse 11 says, But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. And we learn what the meek are like from the rest of that psalm. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read some ideas that come out of it. The meek are those who don't fret because of evildoers. They are not envious of those who gain wealth by criminal activity. They trust the Lord. They do good. They dwell in the land and befriend, befriend faithfulness. And the point is that the meek are people who don't feel the need to defend themselves, to stand up for their own rights, right? They, the meek are people who consider others before themselves and trust that God is going to provide for what they need, even, even as the world takes from them. And make no mistake, this is seen as weakness in our world, right? This is not a, this is not a, a, a value of the world. Um, or, or, what, or was it the value, a value of the world into which Jesus spoke? If people see this in us, we will be taken advantage of. And, and yet, apparently, we should be meek. And if we are meek, we won't hold it against them because we're going to be mourning the poverty of spirit that, that they don't even recognize in themselves. And we're going to put our trust and hope in God for an eternal future in which we've inherited the earth and we delight ourselves in abundant peace. That's, that's the promise, right? It's not now. It's, it's coming. So whose blessing are we going to seek? Are we going to seek, are we going to seek God's blessing through meekness? Or are we going to you know, aim to stand up for our, for our rights and empower ourselves and, and, and join in the, with the blessing of the powers of the world? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So when you've willingly experienced being taken advantage of, um, you, you will sort of begin 
Uh, I don't know if this is naturally or supernaturally, but you'll begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness here meaning patterns of life conformed to God's will. And that hunger and thirst meaning a deep, like existential need, like a gnawing pit in your stomach, like, you know, physical hunger um, that can only be satisfied by experiencing it. Who's Whose blessing do we seek? Will we fill our need? Uh, Will we fill our hunger and thirst for righteousness with righteousness? Or are we going to try to fill it instead with what the world what the world offers and what the world says it can offer? Will we will we satisfy our hunger uh, for righteousness with power? Will we satisfy it with pleasure until we are numb to what we originally hungered for? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And so as the pattern of your life is conformed to God's will and your hunger and thirst for righteousness is satisfied, it's, it's just the obvious next. You will find that you are merciful. When, when earlier we mourned the state of the world and found ourselves hungering and thirsting for righteousness, now we show love to those who are lost and alone and without hope, to the miserable. Not because we have to or because it's easy, but because we've been loved. We've been shown mercy. So there are some hard questions. How do we, as people of the kingdom, how do we respond to the downtrodden? How do we respond to the oppressed in our own community? And not just to the ones that are polite or who are easy to deal with, but to the ones that are crude or rough or who would take advantage of our kindness and mercy? Am I gentle and engaged? Or am I callous and cold? What, what has been my own experience with God's mercy? Which, whose, whose blessing do I seek? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This one uh, convicts me to my core. I... I look, at, I look at this blessing and, and I feel cursed. <laughs> because will I ever, am, am I ever going to be pure in heart? Will, will we ever give our hearts only, solely, completely, perfectly over to one thing? Do we have split loyalties? Or is God the only one in view when you close your eyes? What and whom do I love? And how much? And what do I want more than anything else? Do I want to be like Christ more than I want anything else in this world? Do I want to see God even now on this side of eternity? Am I willing to seek after that and and lay aside everything else? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemakers is such a fascinating term to me here, because this is, this is, this is not just like a peaceful person or one who like loves peace. and is. Uh, um, but this, this is more than just the absence of war or conflict. It, it actually has the sense of a person who, uh, who makes people and communities whole. Right, and it, it means like we get, we have to get dirty. We got to get our hands dirty in in the affairs of the world, and we don't do it so that we can pick sides or so we can decide who's right. But we do it so that we can make peace, so that we can make people who are fighting whole. And we can only do it by giving of our own selves. That's all we have to offer, right? You give of you you. Break yourself to make others whole. And anybody who's been in one of these experiences of trying to like insert themselves into uh, a fight between multiple parties without picking sides, kind of you kind of know this, right? Like you just get beat up on by both sides then, right? Nobody likes you. That's welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, it's gonna hurt. 
And it, it may not ever seem like there's a reward on this, on this side. But we are called to trust and to believe that the reward is more than we could ever hope for. That we're going to begin to take on the character and the life and the image of a son of God. Even as we wait for, for fulfillment of that in eternity. I'm... I'm running over, and I apologize. Um, but how are we doing? This is this is no big deal, right? Let's just just go out and get on that. Um, I think if we're if we're honest with ourselves, if I'm honest with myself, I fail at all of this all the time. Um, I, I fail at living up to the uh, to the type of person who is blessed in God's kingdom. But I put my hope in the one who is the ultimate son of God, whom all the other hopeful sons and children of God are hoping to imitate. Because we find that Jesus is, is he's the deliverer of this news and of this announcement about the kingdom, and he also becomes the living example. He's the only one that perfectly embodies all of the characteristics of the blessed, of those who are approved by God. He was born into poor and humble circumstances, and he mourned the state of the world. He, he mourned it, and he, he mourned the state of the hearts of his, his own people who did not recognize him. And he did not defend his own rights, but he sought the welfare and the well-being of others way before himself, always before himself. And he's the only one whose pattern of life is perfectly conformed to God's will. He's the only one who, in his hunger and thirst for righteousness, found, had, had, had that perfect uh, righteousness to fit the need. He's the only one who perfectly loves all of us, even though we don't deserve it, whose mercy is perfect and pure, even though we are rude and unappreciative in return, even now, all the time. He was in constant communication with his father. He was, a pure, he was the pure in heart. He is the pure in heart who sees God. And he inserted himself not just into difficult situation between two human parties in conflict to make peace, which he certainly did, but he also made peace between God and man through his work on the cross. Colossians uh, says it like this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So there's just a little bit more to go. Bear with me. Um, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember that up until this point, none of this was commandment. None of this was even invitation. It was just announcement, like this is this is what's real now, over and over again. These are the people who are blessed. And you were just sort of left, like, I, I wonder how it felt to be one of the people in the crowd that day and not know what was coming next and, and to wonder, like, am I in? Do I, get, do I get to be part of this? Do I? And, and so Jesus is building this tension with this crowd and all of a sudden just... It just turns, and he turns to the crowd, and he turns right to you, to, to each one of us. And he says, blessed are you. Six times in this couple of verses where before there were none. So the question is, can you, can you see yourself there? Um, can you imagine yourself there on that day um, that he's delivering this message to these people. 
You've got Galilean dirt between the toes of your sandaled feet, and you're tired, and you're hungry, and your body doesn't work quite right, and you've never mattered in this world before, and you, don't, you, you, you look around you and you see that things are not as they should be. And I think that's, that's as true then um, as it is now. And you didn't know what you were expecting to hear today, but when Jesus starts talking, it's like, it's like the earth starts shaking. And you're waiting, and you're waiting for, for, for there to be an invitation to join, to be, to be a part of it. And now that the, that the proclamation, now that the announcement has turned into invitation, the earth shaking turns into the earth opening up. And you've got to choose a side. Are you going to, am I, are we, are we going to hold back and settle for the blessings of this world, for, for the temporary what can I get as I exercise my own will and power and strength? Or will I jump across and, and deny myself and seek the blessing of God following the footsteps of Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we are so <laughs> challenged by your Son, by who he is and by, by what he said and by how he lived it out and showed us the way. We pray for your Spirit to move mightily here. That we, would, uh, that we would rest in the completed work of your Son and that we would take up his blessings, that we would seek after your kingdom, that we would live out the words of, um, of your message to us, of the message that you were in the habit of giving. Thank you for uh, we thank you for the blessings. We thank you for just the incredible way in which you announced this new reality. Um, and, and we pray that you would hold it in our hearts and that we would meditate on these words and that we would consider them as we go through our, our day to day and as we uh, encounter challenges that are just readily apparent, readily evident, and, and ready for us. Um, may, may, we be, may, be, may, may we be ready to meet them through the Spirit. We thank you for your Son. We pray these things in his holy name. Amen.